no no pressure guys uh, the last pod had 23000 views with mike james and uh, demo yeah but the previous one with all of us it was also pretty successful no 12 around 12 13 something like that yeah so that's the line we should we should follow and you of know, course you not, should, you not, just start not the, every day you're getting mike james and demo on the podcast and not and every day nice you have the free faku situation you know that's true that's true. i just clicked on the video and i saw that there are 136 youtube comments <laughs> and i realized <laughs> oh they said something about zvezda and, and capasso <laughs> they the, said something big yeah that, probably you know, the fans didn't like something that demo said <laughs> it was pretty obvious i didn't go through the comments but i'm pretty sure i'm right <laughs> yeah they actually said that i didn't expect that uh, you are 100 percent right yeah. i didn't expect them to be so uh, open and clear and straightforward that they're kind of okay that the Euroleague didn't lift the ban because you know you cannot put one player above others and the mo what's the most important in this yearly can just in today's life just be paid on time or just to be paid on uh, in general uh, so they were supporting this idea that you know Zvezda deserved this ban and as sad it is I think that Mike also said that he he talked with Faku as well, but you know it is what it is. So so yeah, it the was only thing it was a great interview. It was really, as you said, like it's interesting to see players talk so openly about maybe their colleagues, about maybe what you really should do better, what we like and what we don't like. You don't hear that pretty much at any time. But uh, I did not uh, agree with the Euroleague All-Star Game idea. To me, <laughs> that was... Uh, I have... In Europe, All-Star Games, uh, in my eyes, there shouldn't be any, in, an All-Star Game in Europe. I don't know why. It's not... A, I don't... They, they said, you know, you should do it in a country where the fans are crazy, you know, and they mentioned, you know, Serbia, Israel... Uh, Istanbul, Kona Istanbul, as well. Kona as well um, even though they started from Barcelona, I don't know how we got to Konas. Like from that part, you, you know, mm. measuring the cities. But in my eyes, it wouldn't be a successful idea. I, I think it's very simple. Players just need some, some weekends off yo, just Mike, to hang out. Mike James need... want to maybe hang out with other players. Other players would, would love to yeah. do that. I don't know. but, if, but... If, if the players buy the idea and they're into it, and they want to participate, then it could be something at least entertaining. It, maybe but, it's just worth a, worth a try. But knowing that it's the Euroleague and knowing um, how strict uh, the coaches are, I don't see one thing happening for sure that coaches allow their best players to participate in a dunk contest. Mm -hmm. I remember when we used to have uh, these um, All-Star Weekends in Lithuania and after that it was uh, like the Cup Final Four mixed with a dunk contest and a three-point contest and I remember that Sharas would never give Jalgiris players to a dunk contest or or to the three-point contest he would always send uh, Some young guy. 13th or 14th uh, player on his roster. So basically it's hard to see how uh, Dejan Radonic lives with the idea that Derek Williams is is putting up a show in a dunk contest and dunking over people. He might get hurt. Who knows? Um, I but mean, that's that's the point. The game itself, the All Star Game. Uh, what we've learned about the NBA All Star Game recently, it can be excited, exciting, as long as there's competition. Yeah. And when they introduced the new format for the very first time, do you remember? It that was, was really it, it was the the year when we lost Kobe Bryant and uh, they named the MVP award uh, in his name and players were really into it. It was uh, every quarter, I think to a certain amount of points. Yes, yeah. and then uh you play the last quarter until you reach 24 points from what the leading team has yeah. at that moment. To score that final bucket was hard. It probably I ha haven't seen that type of defense in in, mm. in the NBA playoffs. Mm. They were fouling each other. They didn't allow a jump shot. Layup was impossible. That gets you exciting, e excited. But after that, next year and the year after, you got back to dunks and layups and frees and and uh, the All Star Game MVP is Giannis Antetokounmpo with. 25 dunks so yeah i cannot see the game being competitive i i can't imagine that for 40 minutes the best euroleague players would be there on the court fighting and i mean risking their health or creating a really nice show 
you know, somehow. Yeah, I was actually lucky enough to be in that particular All-Star game in Chicago. It was an amazing event. I didn't follow and didn't see uh, the following events, but it was it was it was huge. Regarding this All-Star thing and sending the 13 for 14 guys to the three-point shooting contest and or the dunk contest, that's actually the big issue that EuroLeague and uh, not just the let's say headquarters of EuroLeague, but also teams are uh, are addressing right now. I mean, we should stop looking at what's the best for coaches. We should look what's the best for the interest of the league. And if the EuroLeague would be interested in making it a successful event to get some profit, which in the end would benefit for everybody, teams and players. I mean, coaches shouldn't have a word. But uh, that's the thing. That. I mean, if the coach convinces the player that you shouldn't be there, I don't want you to be there. And the player then says, now nah, I'm good. I'm skipping this one. In the NBA dunk contest, you don't see the best players anymore. Never. No superstars. I want to see Morant, you know. People wanted to see LeBron James for 20 years. He never went Almost on. 20. Uh, we never saw him. But in that's the a different contest. conversation. I mean, they're already good enough financially. Yearly has to do something to improve the general financial picture. And if they think that All Star event can boost a little bit the current situation, then everybody should be involved for the best of the product. I mean, to, to make a great All Star game, at least in the first years, just to check if it really can can draw some money, you know, for for everybody. And it, it feels like the Euro League is really interested. I had an interview with Marshall Glickman as well, and he liked this idea of the All Star event. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see this event like in the next season or, or two seasons uh, after. But we are facing another issue. Do you see there's, there's an empty, schedule, an empty already, weekend? Yeah. That's the problem. Empty weekend, which you could take for uh, for uh, such an event. Uh, you have a week off when the teams are playing uh, in, the cup. in the national cups. Then you have these international windows when some players leave, some players stay, but you continue playing Euroleague games. And when do you play this All Star game? That's another question. But and, this and question the players actually, already want uh, shorter seasons. And but this yeah. question actually involves all the things around. We're not yeah. just talking about the All Star game. We're talking about the playing tournament, which seems to be inevitable. Actually, yeah. from from what I hear, from what I've heard from that interview as well, we want that extended playoff series. Make it happen for this year. Seeing at the standings <laughs> and uh, oh, yeah. how competitive oh, Euroleague yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. But the schedule, I just, I mean, Euroleague has a lot of DDS, but a lot of different parties has to be involved and it's it's a very huge expectation. Listen, as a basketball fan, I'm already okay with the idea that this all-star weekend format is done. You've seen everything already. Yeah. It won't get any better. The best dunk contests were in the past. Uh, the best all-star games you already saw them as well. Uh, we saw everything. We saw Michael Jordan in his era. The All-Star Games East versus West was actually a rivalry in those days. Right yeah. now, the thing I'm most forward looking to is the three-point contest. The three-point contest, yes, because it always excites you. And in the NBA, you usually have uh, some of the best players. You have Steph Curry. You're always excited to see Steph. Uh, so that's the only thing. But other than that, the All-Star Game, the Dunk Contest, Skills Challenge, and all the other things, I mean, I think it's just for them to have their fun, relax mm. a little bit. But for me as a basketball fan, it's not exciting. Back in the days when I was a teenager, yes, for sure. I would wake up in the night, I would see the All-Star Game in Las Vegas when LeBron James was, like, I think in his sophomore year or something like that. Uh, you still have Shaq, you still have uh, Iverson, Kobe, many, many great, great players. It was different. It hit you different. And right now, we're talking that the NBA with all these global superstars doesn't have enough to offer during the All-Star Weekend. What can EuroLeague offer that would, exactly. would, would be better? I don't see exactly. that. I don't see that. Sorry. And these European basketball fans, when they're talking about cities like Konas, uh, Tel Aviv, Istanbul, like take a casual Konas fan. He wants to see his own team. He wants to see a quality basketball game with some passion, with some interests of winning it. And he's not willing to spend 150 euros on an all-star weekend, honestly. I don't see that. 
Me neither. And I don't see uh, Olympiakos Ultras traveling to an All-Star game <laughs> to support <laughs> Sasha Vizenkov in a three-point contest. Yeah. So I'm sorry, I don't see that happening also. I just think that there's nothing wrong at least to try to make some kind of event. Of course... No, uh, I'm not saying it's wrong to try, but yeah. there are too many obstacles in the schedule. Yeah, I mean, I see more... Uh, skepticism and positivity regarding the success of this event, but if there's this interest, if the players uh, really look looks like they're involved, they're interested, maybe with some format changes, except from the dunk contest and three-point contest, of course, but I mean, regarding the game format, how to make it more competitive, I mean, it's worth a try, and then we would see uh, how it could go uh, in the following years. Anyways, uh, any other... Uh, by the way, the interview with Marshall Glickman, where we, he actually was also pretty bold about Facundo Compasso situation should be published on Tuesday or on Wednesday. I think it's uh, worth uh, a watch, uh, not just because of Compasso situation, where he got pretty much in depth about it, but also some other things like the format expansion, some potential markets that could join the EuroLeague. Uh, he actually said some interesting things about the commentators of games because there was a question from beyond plus member how the broadcasting uh, experience for fans could be improved and he was pretty harsh on the current uh, EuroLeague uh, commentators so a lot of different angles for he, that he didn't he didn't mention anything about the post game interviews mm, no i mean we had limited time so i wasn't about to uh, give like two yeah, three minutes yeah, for yeah, this in some cities you need for a, some a, trash you need a sub right interviews. right away yeah that's true that's I, true i think we've addressed this issue <laughs> two seasons ago, when yep. we started this podcast, there was just two of us. Nothing has changed, except we don't have Russian teams anymore. But now, that's an improvement. But now I would say that <laughs> Italian. Uh, mm, uh, I must admit, these post game that, that, that's a struggle guys, to listen. That's and that's to wait for them to finish the sentence. That's that's in yeah, interesting for sure. Now, but in conclusion, what I wanted to say, like my final thought, is this: uh, twenty years ago, I would cheer for a spectacular dunk right now i would rather cheer for a good defensive play and good defensive plays just don't happen in an all-star game and easy dunks don't get you excited anymore but you know maybe that's you got a, old that's, that's what that's happens when you watch basketball for 20 <laughs> that's plus exactly, years exactly that's what i'm talking you're got old and maybe these kids these younger generations which like you said you were you know amazed fascinating by all these stars and watching some of the first events maybe that's the you're like, they're really looking at younger generation how to get involved them uh so maybe that's j their way to reach new new audiences by making this this type of game i don't know okay uh that's it about Mike and Demo's thoughts. Uh, and this quick one about Sasha Vizenkov. First time I heard, I, I heard him talking, a really cool guy. And not because <laughs> he said that he watches the videos. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> he's a really cool guy, really honest. Uh, yeah. I really enjoyed listening to him. I can't say I'm, I was work. surprised, but he was, you can see that the, the guy, you know, he has, he's so sincere. He, yeah, he just, he's so low profile in terms of like he's not exaggerating his current situation and his season. He's such a simple guy, actually. I mean, positive energy all over. Yeah. I don't know. And I, I actually thought that I will get some empty empty quotes. You know, there are some great players, solid players, without let's say bold personalities. So usually in some interviews you don't expect anything. But he mm. was he was actually interesting. He was entertaining. He was also open minded with some some let's say MVP candidates, for example. I was surprised that he mentioned Matthias Lazort as his number one guy to get this award. True. And there was this interesting clash of approaches. When I talked with Mike, when I asked him, tell give me your MVP description. He's like Mike. He said something <laughs> like, you know Mike. Um <laughs> He, he he emphasized the player, which if you would take him out of the team, let's see what that team would do. And when I talked with Sasha, he emphasized a lot how important it is to be consistent. And I don't know if Sasha didn't mention Mike James in his top three on purpose, or it was just by accident, or he, I he mean, just didn't, you, he just f forgot, you know? Because when, uh, when you had the interview, Mike James actually played three not so good games. So maybe that affected his choices. I don't know. Because after that, he uh, had a good game in Belgrade. It's just that Monaco didn't show up. Did not appear in that game. Yep. Yeah. Maybe that's the starting point for, for but our... I'm actually discussion. more more on the Mike James camp uh, on mm. regarding this MVP discussion. 
because to me, an MVP is someone who actually carries the team. This is why I said that Lorenzo Brown is the clear Eurobasket MVP and not Villar and Gomez that yeah. has a better PIR. Lorenzo mm -hmm. carried the team. Take Lorenzo Brown out of the team, you cut Willier and Gomez numbers in half. Mm. So basically, I agree with the, the whole idea, and Sasha Vezenkov is playing an MVP season, but when I saw a uh, game against uh, Armani, without Vezenkov, or he was in the game, but uh, he still played limited minutes. It was his first so game ba back. Basically, Alec Peters took his minutes, and when Alec Peters played that first quarter, I thought to myself, Vezenkov is a great basketball player, but Olympiakos is a great team that makes these players so good. Alec Peters can play on Vezenkov level for some games, actually. So the game yeah. in Monaco, Vezenkov wasn't even on the court in the fourth quarter. Of course, it was decision by yeah. Barsokas, and I really believe that there's a lot of it, it, a lot, there's a lot of behind it because of his groin injury. He just returned from yeah. a groin injury, mm. and it's 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 shitty injury which might be you know affect you for for a longer run after you come back. So maybe it was also behind that, but at the same time, you know, he showed up huge against Virtus playing through this big stomach issues that actually put uh, Sluka sideline and he made some great plays in the end, including this last uh, tip uh, to, to throw away Lundberg's basket, I think it was in the end. So, yeah, and the problem is with this MVP, is, you know, uh, approach that actually we don't have that many teams with one, you know, clear leader on it that carries on the whole team. A lot of, of these teams has at least two or three guys who are mm. equally important. Last season with Mike, I agree. I mean, it was it was different team. Now you, you see way more talent on it. And you cannot say that excluding Mike James, you know, there's mm. nothing behind it. I think it's, it's, it's a normal debate. Uh, some people have their opinions others think differently it's it's really okay you have a vote and you can vote how do you however do you want like if you see Vazenkov and Olympiakos as a good team and Vazenkov you see his numbers and his impact you vote for him if you think that Lorenzo Brown is carrying Maccabi on his own or Mike James is delivering uh, and carrying Monaco, Monaco you vote for these guys but my only problem is that it happens after the quarterfinal series Oh it's, yeah, it's not a regular season award, and yeah. it doesn't make any sense. True, that's true. Because now we're talking about Vizenkov as a clear favorite, but who knows? Maybe Olympiakos loses in the quarterfinal. Yeah, we don't vote for somebody who is not in the final four, then, right? Yeah, kind of. You have to be even in the final if right four. now he's a clear MVP. Yeah, to be for honest, sure. this is why you should make it strictly a regular season award, and that's true. it. Okay, guys, let's Olympiakos start. Olympiakos beat Virtus. Uh, and Milos Teodosic lost a, his just temper a, again. Just a quick uh, reminder. Uh, being a BN Plus member gives a lot of great extra features, including addressing questions to Marshall Glickman, addressing questions to Sasha Vazenkov and all the other greats of the EuroLeague. Uh, and also uh, we have, now we have very active WhatsApp group. Uh, so it's 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 really worth a try. You can become become Basket News Plus members on basketnews.com slash plus. And also what helps us to grow is just pressing this like button, subscribing, subscribing our channel. These are very small things to do, but they really help us to grow. So just a quick reminder before we begin our podcast where we will discuss um, this big time mistake in, in, in Bologna uh, regarding officiating, also Sasha Bradovic kiss. We will rate uh, top moves around the transfer deadline in, in the EuroLeague. We have some NBA topic uh, for the end of the podcast. Uh, we will share our first big free of FS impressions. So a lot of uh, to be discussed today. So you guys wanted to bring in this Virtus Olympiakos game, right? Yeah. Mistake, first and foremost? Mistake first and foremost, too many mistakes lately, to uh -huh. be honest, happening in the, in the EuroLeague. And uh, Milos Teodosic is playing amazing. Uh, let's say Virtus finally have found uh, some strength on the perimeter, but for him to react in such a way after you know what is going to be a reviewed you know, play, it's just for me, it's, uh, it's stupid. And uh, he got thrown away out of the game when they easily could have won with the last shot. And Ife Lundberg uh, then um, missed uh, a pretty good shot in the end. But to me, it should have been Milos Teodosic taking that last shot. 
the way he the way he's playing. So, but that foul called on uh, Semi Ojale against Kostas Papanikolaou was just it should have been a play on. Why was there even a foul? One of the worst I, I don't calls know. I remember. I don't know what you guys think about that, but wow. No, it's just one of the worst calls I really remember. You cannot say it had the final impact of the game because Olympiakos, what, they were like still up by three or two. There were like one yeah. minute and 20 seconds to play or, or less, maybe less than one minute. I don't remember. I don't remember. But still, it was important for the momentum of the game. Still, Bilos Teodosic should control himself. Oh, for sure. I'm talking about the second technical. He was ejected for the second, second time, time this year. This and I don't remember anybody else being ejected at least twice. I mean, from players, not not coaches, mm. in the same season. That's pretty rare in the EuroLeague. He got too many coffees, you know, before the game, maybe. <laughs> yeah, or something some with the coffee. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but honestly, <laughs> what Milos did during this double game week uh, deserves a lot of respect. Yeah. Uh, I can take you back to the first game where, where they faced Ralgiris. If not for Milos, there wouldn't even be a competition in the, in that game. And all of a sudden, I'm watching this game, I'm, I'm covering this game, and I'm thinking to myself, what the fuck is this 2010 or 2011? What's happening? All of a sudden, Milos Teodosic is the best point guard in Europe again for these stretches on the court, like five or six minutes, he's just dominating every single pick and roll, every single shot. Uh, he, he's drawing fouls, he's dishing assists uh, left and right. And you're thinking like, how is this possible? I remember in the second game week in Kaunas, Milos Teodosic was the guy who actually buried Virtus and, and it looked like he's done, he's yeah. finished. Nope, he's not. <laughs> he's back. <laughs> That's he was, amazing. He was really. making he was making all the right decisions. To be honest, yeah. in, in that game it was incredible. Just an incredible game and, by him. And it's such a such a pity for for Scariolo. Like you have such a great talent, a veteran point guard who's still one of the best. But at the same time, it's very hard for you to have a solid defense with him on the court for longer True. minutes. So when you have to play Milos Teodosic for 25 minutes, you know he's going to do some great things, but defensively you might have to suffer. And this is where you realize that in the long run, Milos is still going to play like 16 or 18 minutes per game because that's the only way. Yeah, at least he still has the best plus and minus on his team. I just have this you know, inner question is if Milos Teodosic being your best player on the team is good or bad for, for the fate of your team, Right now, it's it's not great. Uh, I don't I don't see him like leading the team, playing 25, 27 minutes, and 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 them being successful. But having Milos Teodosic on your team, sometimes to call him from the bench w when you need to like resurrect your offense, I think it's a good thing. Uh, but the problem that Virtus signed too many guards, and some of these guards are hurt, injured, and they are not playing, and some of these guards are basically not delivering, like Ife Lundberg. Uh, when I watch him this season, sometimes I'm starting to think like he's a bit overrated. When mm -hmm. He played for CSKA, he went to Phoenix, and now Virtus signed him as a supposedly star of the show. Mm. He, I don't think he has it in him. He was like, he had this very quick route to yeah. the top. Like he ro he rose pretty quick and I don't really see him being the number one guy, like let's say Lorenzo Brown is for Maccabi. He's not at the same level. And you made an interesting point about uh, Milos playing time. He's playing, uh, if at the start of the season, he never uh, uh, surpassed 20 minute mark in the first 10, uh, 11 games. From the round 13, he is every game playing more than 20 minutes. And uh, it would be interesting to see Virtus, you know, win and loss record in those nine games and in the uh, second part right now in the season. But I don't think there would be a much, you know, a huge, a huge difference. Yeah, well, at least he's a good pickup for your fantasy team right now. That's for sure. But uh, this year, uh, it's, during, it's, during be this it's better to not take... Uh, people for fantasy from Italian teams. Since round 15, I, you I already <laughs> You've learned from your mistakes? I've learned from my mistakes. <laughs> Kevin Pangos, Brandon Davies. Uh, Shabazz Napier. Oh, sorry. Uh, Shabazz Napier? 
Kemba Walker? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I'm so tired after this week. Uh, after the previous week, it was a re- really long trip. What do you have in mind? Man, Luva Vuka, the other guard from Milan. <laughs> Nazmit Rulon. Nazmit Nazmit Rulon. Rulon. <laughs> oh yeah, I took him after Kevin Pimes yeah, went yeah. down with the injury. He got was minus, like minus 10 or minus something. 10 or something. Yeah, yeah. You might, might have some luck with Billy Baron though. Yeah, I, I had him in the last... Uh, Just don't make any video fire. about him, okay? Because Mahu. usually when you make those breakdowns, oh. all these teams just collapse. It collapse usually. So, so now it should be the Dallas Mavericks and the Luca. Oh, that's right. That's right. Nah, he's not. By impact. the way, you, you mentioned that since round thirteen, I don't think you have those powers to yeah. hurt Luca and his game. Since round thirteen, you mentioned that he started playing all the time over twenty minutes, right? Yeah. Oh, so he was actually averaging thirteen point one points and seven assists per game. That's huge. And 33, uh, 23 minutes. Yeah. That's nice. Regarding and his winning shooting, record, I don't know. And his uh, three-point shooting percentage should be extremely high. Too, I know, mean, that, we, that's the I'm thing. Looking. Milos Teodosic on the court, even these days, he makes the game of basketball better. Does he make his team stronger and closer to the playoffs? I'm not sure. But four, he definitely three. makes the game beautiful. I don't know. To me, it, he has made Virtus a little better. Okay. Like he, his offense had more impact than his maybe, let's say, uh, his weaknesses on the defense. And he's tr- trying really hard. You can't say anything about, you know, energy or or that he doesn't want to play defense. You know, it's simple that, you know, he's just not as good as a defender as, you know, the yeah. offensive players in front of him are. So that's... That's the only thing, and uh, but Virtus needed someone uh, who simply can make a bucket, can make a pass, can score in easy points because yeah. they were really struggling. Because you know the Scariolo teams, Virtus are, are kind of a similar team to what Spain was in the in the in the EuroBasket, but you know in Spain had Lorenzo Brown, who mm. who was carrying everything, and in the, in the start of the season they were struggling because they couldn't find one guy who could do that. You know, and at one and point of the season, like two rounds ago, nobody was averaging more than ten more points. More than ten points. And the Milos yeah, actually yeah. in the last seven games they won four uh, of of seven, and the actually those wins included Fenerbahce, Barcelona, Maccabi games. So that's pretty solid. But they had to win at least one in this double game week. I think it hurt them too much in the standings, losing to Jalgiris first of all, and then to Olympiacos where they were pretty close. Uh, yeah, but those are some good points and good. Uh, stats about Milos and his impact there they would have been one win away right now from the a spot if exactly. they had one let's say or Jalgris or Olympiacos right yeah. now it's two and in the eighth spot you have uh Anadol Efes yeah exactly yeah I got the name right uh but <laughs> just this to me is a very very, very strange team actually when you look at the roster you're thinking like there's size there's experience there's physicality but then you see how many players are not playing up to their standards like especially Toko Shengelia it looks like it's so hard to fit him in into your system into yeah. the, how you want to play you cannot use him as a stretch four you try to do a lot of post up plays for him then Jalgiris goes to double him forces him to pass the ball he doesn't take the best decisions and you're thinking like is he the right fit for this team i know, you know he's a good basketball player but he doesn't fit the system it's hard to play right now uh, with two non-shooting bigs. Exactly. Almost nobody exactly. is doing that. And w- with him on the court, Virtus doesn't have a center that can, you know, shoot from outside, be a threat. Yeah. So we have Jaiter Bako only exactly. paint. And uh, that's three and three guys who can shoot. And maybe you have, you know, Payola on the court who you can is another guy. Mm. He he can shoot, but you can decide to risk from him. So their front line actually reminds me a lot of Monaco, but the difference is that they have Mike James Lloyd and Okobo on their backcourt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so exactly. that, that makes some difference. Yeah, Virtus is a bit of an old school team, actually, and uh, and that's why and that's why I think that Teodosic needs to play more than twenty mm-hmm. minutes. But I don't see them in the playoffs in this uh, context. I mean, before the season, I picked them as as my number eight. Me too. But right now. I'm pretty skeptical about it. Although I love watching Milos and probably Milos himself is the reason why I will watch some Virtus, Virtus games, games in the future. But 
Yeah, that's, that's race, just not... race for the eighth spot is going to be for seven, for the eight, seventh, and eighth for the spot sixth, is going to be... also for the fifth, the fourth, the third, and the that's second true. and the first. That's true. <laughs> this loss against Jalgiris for me was very surprising. Jalgiris was playing their first game without their best guy, one of the best players in the Euroleague, Keenan Evans. You can say second game because against Fenerbahce they played 39 that, minutes that's true. without him. That's true, but you know, it's it's different because now Virtus, Milan, they knew that Jalgiris is coming without Keenan Evans and maybe, you know, and Fener, with the new signings. Yeah, yeah and maybe Fener was a little bit distracted by this complete game uh, plan uh, change, but yeah, they brought two new players uh, they played their first games. Uh, they played with Keenan without Keenan Evans. They they played away where they don't have a good, uh, didn't have good uh, record before. So that was lo- that loss was so surprising. And I mean, when you look at what Coach Maxvitas did with the Jargadis team, this is something amazing. I mean, he already beat Etre Messina's teams uh, team twice, Scariolo twice, Itudis Fenerbahce once, Trinkieri Bayern once, Isikavicius Barca once. Choose Matea and Real Madrid once. That's that's an amazing record mm. for Max Vitas. Uh, with this team, that's an incredible well, list. W- when you say that he's beaten Messina's team twice, it sounds impressive. But did Israel Gonzalez beat Messina's team twice? I know, I know. <laughs> Who didn't beat Messina's team twice? Only those teams that didn't play Messina's <laughs> team twice. Yeah, <laughs> these are some fair points, but you can't take this away one those hurts. wins. This one hurts, it is, but <laughs> man, but that he, was a good one. <laughs> Jalgir has beat three of four yeah. top four teams. That's just amazing, and you cannot know, say that it happened by accident. By accident, because he has that history of beating powerhouses. We all know him from Lithuanian experience, coaching Neptunas or Letkabel. He he made LKL finals twice, I think, uh, and he was constantly beating uh, Jalgiris. I think only once. Maritas. I think Neptunas didn't go to the finals with him. Oh, it was the one in the finals year. with the Mitis. So Max only Vitas was Kabilis. with Kabilis, yeah. Okay, could be. Uh, yeah, f- for sure. I agree. I'm, I'm just joking about the Milan part, but uh, yeah. basically, what, what what we saw right now in these two games in Italy uh, for Jalgiris, uh, how important it is to start the game. Uh, the right way because in the first part of the season they basically lost some ga- games especially in mm. Belgrade against Partizan when they didn't start properly and now you build a lead early like in Bologna I think it was 16-6 after Virtus missed all of their shots from the paint and Jalgiris just started as usual they're very aggressive they're looking for offensive rebounds they're feeding Roland Schmitz when they see a mismatch and all these uh, details and they are playing without a point guard in the starting lineup Thomas Dimsha is there and Brasdekis is just playing his ISO basketball he gets first two buckets he already feels better about himself and that helps you moving forward but you have a 10 point lead in the first quarter so from that point Virtus has to climb the mountain and they did reach the top in the end of the third quarter, but uh, as long as Jalgiris had a game pretty close, playing away from home, it's okay for them. And then in the fourth quarter, you have to praise the whole organization that they reacted so quickly to sign two additional players. Isaiah Taylor, he will need some time. He will not be as good as Keenan Evans was. But that fourth quarter against Virtus, when Teodosic was resting, and Jalgiris had problems creating shots basically taylor started just driving scoring drawing fouls and and he broke the game for jalgiris that was his debut game yeah. for jalgiris and he played the fourth quarter he had the trust from the coach to me that's the best uh, uh the best thing that casis max has uh he has a very good feeling which players should be on the court on the particular moment and which players should be on the bench at that time. He doesn't really care who has the biggest contract in the team. Like when Brasdakis was struggling and you saw that it's better for the team to have him on the bench in the fourth quarter, that was not an issue. Imša was playing uh, Butkiewicz and one of us in the same same lineup they were playing. Sometimes you look at these Jalgiris lineups and you're thinking, how on earth can they score points? Somehow they do. And mm-hmm. sometimes it's it's impossible actually to break down the way they're playing and to explain what is happening. They always lose to the opponent's team on, on, on the assist department. Doesn't matter. They ha- have probably the worst assist to turnover ratio in the league. Doesn't matter again. They're being aggressive, offensive rebounds, second chance points. They draw a lot of fouls. They're being very physical. They build the team basically 
to fight, not to just play basketball, but to fight on the court. And it's working for them so far. And that's a lot of credit to, to the coach. To me, it's just the, the speed of how they reacted. Like you mentioned, yeah. the next day, they already had two players basically the next day. So that just tells you the work that has been done before, you know, by the scouts, by the by GMs and, and all the people that are involved. And also and thank you, Anadol Efes, for releasing those guys. That's mm. that that was uh, <laughs> an excellent timing, and bec because it was it was it's just so hard right now in the Euroleague to get new players if you if you like if someone gets injured and I'm not talking about the teams that have 15 players you know like uh, Real Madrid or or I don't know the UFS that have uh, a lot of guys in in every position but for Jalgir is when you lose a guy and you need to replace him with someone good. It's extremely hard, hard right now to find someone in the middle of the season, because basically you have all the, these guys that are maybe playing in lower levels, but there's you know bio situations and stuff, and they reacted so quickly by having the player already on a Friday evening uh, when the guy dude was playing Grand Theft Auto in Houston, and the next day he's already in Konos. That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy speed to me, and it just shows the level of the organization and. Uh, there's an explanation behind it. I mean, they were in contact with Polnara already before Evans got hurt. I mean, I'm there was an I'm idea. talking about Isaiah uh, Taylor. Taylor more. was a free agent, so that also yeah, helped. exactly. Probably his he was the only Euroleague player that became the free agent from from guards. But usually obviously. negotiations yeah. take some time. Uh, it's it's. But he, he the thing is that he's represented he, by Mishko Rajnatovic, and from what I remember with, with, from his interview uh, when I. Mm, talked to him last year in, in Niche, I think it was the Serbian Cup final. Uh, he said something that it for me it was always easy to negotiate with Jalgiris because everybody knows uh, what they want. Uh, he trusts Jalgiris as an organization for his players you know, to, to, to develop or to use that platform as a shift. And usually they always discuss those deals in like one or two hours. So when I saw okay. that deal happening, I was not surprised at all. <laughs> it's just this Mishko and Jalgiris cool. relation. I actually thought after Evans got hurt that Okay, they, they survived in the Fenerbahce game. They got the very important win to finish the first half of the season. But then I thought we have a double game week in Italy. Probably was, we won't sign new players before that week. So they will have to suffer with the roster they have. Hopefully they get one win. I wasn't really sure about that. I thought like Virtus, they're on a roll. They beat Barcelona. Olympia, you saw some better games at the same time, of course, once again, you saw what happened in Berlin, but I, I was just thinking like one win should be good. Would be yeah. great. <laughs> would it be would awesome. Be would be great. And they get two. And for the first time in the history of exactly. EuroLeague, Jalgiris win both games on the road in the double game week. It didn't even happen in Charas uh, years. That's crazy. Like you lose a guy who is, who was probably on the way to be a uh, all EuroLeague first or second team yeah. this year. And you go on the, to play the next week, both games away, like nothing really happened. Like to me, it just tells how strong the character of Jalgis mm. this year is, how these guys fit together, their chemistry is amazing. And just that the fighting spirit in the EuroLeague can do a lot of good. Yeah. Like, for especially sure. for these teams that have lower lower budgets. Because like, basketball wise, you're looking at Jalgis <laughs> and you're thinking, how? From where? How? From where they're how scoring? Are they, like, how at, are at they some points seven? when they put some lineups, I'm just thinking, would they advance to the next stage of the Champions League or not? Just Look, roster wise. Before the season, like oh, somebody yeah. somebody approaches me and says, uh, you know what? We're gonna have a lineup with Dimsha, Butkavichus, Ulanovas, Schmitz, and Kavari's Hayes. And Hayes. And my <laughs> answer would be, yeah, good luck scoring two points in a quarter. Nah, they're just beating teams. I know in Milan they had some problems and in the end the they almost quarter, lost right? the game. But that brings another thing to me. Edgar Solanovas, when you need to close the game, all of a sudden it's James Harden. Like, <laughs> those three-point shots he's making this season. He's 31 years old. Uh, he's playing professional basketball for 12 or 13 years. Never in my life I would imagine that I want to see Edgar Olanovas in my crucial possession playing ISO and shooting a dagger over Kyle Hines. Never in my life I would imagine that scenario. I don't know if he worked on that shot, you know, in 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 the summer or what, but one thing is clear. This guy loves being the captain of Jalgiris. Yeah. 
he felt the confidence uh, right from the start of the season and he is riding the wave with that he feels some kind of you know excitement and just responsibility and this responsibility is not you know a constraint to him like for some players maybe that would be too much he is enjoying the moment he is enjoying that he is the Jalgiris captain and and I don't know those step backs we are seeing the, them each game I know he's shooting you know in the last seconds often and you yeah. know it's easier to shoot in the and lines. he is 42 percent but he, yeah exactly he's <laughs> like you it's it, it's a different uh, um, thought when Ulana was shooting freeze this season yeah and before before you you saw him sometimes taking open spot up looks but sometimes he's actually giving them away uh he's taking a uh, freeze in, in transition this year yeah and these shots Ama in the last seconds he's walking into a free like he's kevin durant paul george james harden with the step back or, or someone from from the top shelf uh, of the nba elite players and i think you could say that it's also you know what max Quitis does uh to, to his players complete exactly. freedom that's, complete freedom and yeah. and confidence that's what i wanted to say that just, his players play. coach yeah and if you look at every team he had despite how many <laughs> tricky characters he had on those teams tough personalities he always managed to click them together and a lot of players were just overperforming okay he was not very keen for some young players but uh, for the rest, I mean, some of these players were playing their greatest years under Max Vitas, and that's what he's doing this team. And you mentioned all those different reasons, starting from the organization, how quickly they reacted, uh, how they managed to put those two players for the important double round week. That when then we have this conversation about Ulanovas, our guys. It just shows how great teamwork is with this organization, and you cannot exclude just some players, just some GMs, or even the head coach for the record. They have but but yeah i think actually it has a lot to do with max vita's uh, way of coaching he's he's so different uh, compared to other coaches because he's not the guy who complains a lot he's not crying at oh we're not having this and that position player oh we're not having different schedule we're not having some some other conditions no matter what he has in his lineup and his uh, condition wise let's say he just puts his heads down and he's he goes to work and you cannot say that they're doing any special tactics during games uh yeah. he's not known as a big time uh impact ch changer uh on, on the court but somehow he does his uh he makes his teams play at a really uh nice level and especially there's this fight and grind behind every team he, he was coaching so I have but a actually for you. Be, be, before I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you before uh this year like season we didn't really see Max Vitus as as the coach who builds a strong defensive team defensive minded mm -hmm. team that's true that's the best defensive team he ever and had that has a lot to do not only with him coaching but also with Jargiris choices yeah exactly uh, signing players from their first signings you could see uh, what they want, like when you sign Butkiewicz, Schmitz, and Hayes, it's obviously you're going. Obviously, you're going for physicality, uh, for players who grind. They get offensive rebounds, do all those hustle plays. So it's not only down to the coaching, but also to building the roster, having the idea behind it. And of course, he had his word in in signing players, and 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 he wanted some of these players basically himself, probably, but. To me, this is more about the whole organization than just the coach. <clears throat> so he's not making your, let's say, coach of the year vote. No, no, Ritis was just giving notes to Panathinaikos organization. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> they have more money. They can, Ouch. they can afford to sign talent as well. <laughs> because for Jalgiris, Skinner Evans uh. was the only guy who, who you thought like he's really super skilled. Uh, coach of the year. Who's your coach of the year? Uh, there was this mid-season GM survey, and they picked GMs picked uh, Bartsoka. Situdis was second, but I have a bit I mean, different opinion. I have every, three different three different names. Every <laughs> week it changes. Every week That's it changes. True. When we had seventeen games played, I would go for Penaroya. Mm. With nineteen games played, you can consider Kaziz. Uh, now we have a game against Vesden. If Zvezda wins in Konas, you probably go for Dushko. So <laughs> because I, ha I had him, I, I don't know. I, I man. have him right now because you know with uh, Zvezda, 
with him first 10 games i think were eight and two he completely yeah. changed this team's this team their season yeah. <laughs> everything in 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 Zvezda team and uh i have maxvidis or dusko or peñaro as my candidates and after first 10 games everybody had iturius so i think it's True. Too early to judge. Uh, let the, let let's see how the regular season finishes. Yeah. It's a boring let's answer. See who makes the players, and then I I pick my coach of the year. If Max Vitis leads Jalgiris uh, to the playoffs, mm. yeah. But let, if, let's see but if Basconi makes. But if uh, Zvezda the too, makes yeah. the playoffs and, yeah. as well, <laughs> <laughs> so then I'm thinking who's who's six, who's seven, who's eighth. Uh, uh, you have. Actually, Dusko had the same effect like Sasha Bradovic last year. The difference is that I don't think that this year's Vesda is as talented as Monaco was last year. And regarding Penaroy and Maxvitis, I have actually a um, good escape uh, in this uh, question. If if we would uh, like to reward both, I would go with Maxvitis as the head coach of the year and uh, Basconi uh, taking the GM of the year award because I think it was a brilliant mm. roster building. Uh, with all those signings like Howard, uh, Thompson, Kotsar, and even the head coach, Panaroya. Uh, so I think you could, you know, split those two awards for those teams if decision-making would be right now. Okay, so that's a, still a boring answer, but mm -hmm. <laughs> better than Ritis one. Let's wait for the regular season yeah. to finish. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> because for sure I'm not going to uh, vote just based on results because yeah. right now Real Madrid is leading the standings who is mm. voting for Chus Mateo as coach of the year no one no. Uh, so my condition is very simple if Max Vitis leads Jalgius to the playoffs you know sure it's, it's always about coach of the year for me it's always about a team that surpasses the expectation yes. and you know from yes. Real Madrid you expect greatness because of the roster they have so it doesn't matter who's the coach yeah I've just got a Fun stat from our data guru, Darius Garwales, and he, I think that he says that Teodosic leads the EuroLeague in ejections since 27, uh, 2007 uh, with five ejections. Leon Radosevic is second with three. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I also saw about how this topic is that Nemanja Bielica suffer, suffered another setback. Mm. And he was supposed to play in the next Fenerbahce game. I think it's on our mm -hmm. socials as well. And and, but he has well. some kind of uh, Achilles problem mm. at the moment. That's huge. Looking at I mean, he hasn't played basketball since since, since the NBA Finals. Since exactly, he was he was uh, with the Serbian national team, you know. But he, he didn't play in a game. He was practicing maybe, but that's a long time. Mm -hmm. That's we mentioned we mentioned Jalgiris made making quick solid moves in the in the market and we had this segment probably the main segment of uh, our podcast today. Uh, how would you rank or what would be your top three moves around the transfer deadline? It's not just transfer deadline moves because some of them were made afterwards. Also, uh, we have to be fair. We're speculating a little bit because we can include Chema Moneke and D Bost as let's say done deals although th these deals were not official yet there's Where are some they going? paperwork to do D Bost to as well uh, from Galatasaray on a buyout and Chema Moneke to, to Monaco and Shannon Evans it feels like he said goodbye to Sevilla fans to after Valencia. the last game uh, he was just waving goodbye uh, to the audience so he's he's expected to join Valencia and then of course we have Taylor Polonara and uh, for sure I'm missing somebody. Uh, Singleton, yeah, Chris Singleton. Well, to me the number one is is just both of Jalgiris signings. The way they reacted and uh, they needed players for these positions and they signed those players. And uh, you know what to expect from Polonara. Maybe it's uh, more difficult to predict what Taylor will do and how he will fit the team, but I believe he'll be fine because in Jalgiris you have a lot of opportunities to play your own way. Taylor loves to play in ISO. He loves to have the ball in his hands. He will definitely have these responsibilities more than he did in, in, in FS. It will be more similar to what he used to do for, for Murcia, just on a higher level in the EuroLeague, so the numbers will not be as, as, as big. Uh, so to me, it's still the number one. Uh, also because of how quickly they reacted. But then uh, I was watching Monaco's last game and Dante Hall got hurt and I'm thinking Adrian Moorman didn't work out for them. The roster is not deep. 
they definitely need someone. And if they sign Moneke, I could see that as 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 being huge because they for sure need somebody in the fourth position. And uh, uh, I could see them adding a center as well if Dante Hall is out for a longer time. I'm not sure he had an ankle injury. But yeah, Chima Moneke would solve some problems for them. For sure, because right now Sasha Bradovic has to rely on some of these younger players like Makundu, Strazel, they're playing minutes. I'm fine with Utara playing minutes because he has certain qualities, but uh, uh, these other guys, I'm not sure if they're EuroLeague material right now. And they're still coping without Jordan Lloyd at the moment, which is also a problem. So for sure they need to sign Moneke, and if they have money, I would go for another player as well they're actually looking for a uh, stretch forward let's see who could cover okay. fourth position or third position so that's i'm a bit biased so where is with moneke signing because i think that he's too similar to john brown i would say he also cannot stretch the floor and i was i like a lot of uh you know three pointers in their front line so if you're signing moneke and you still have to sign a number Stretch four, it, for me, it's a bit an issue. And I'm also biased because I loved uh, Makundu performing in his, uh, and scoring his first points uh, against Olympiacos. He's, he's so exciting to watch. He's so raw, actually. He's so raw to watch. But he started playing basketball uh, only when he was 17. So he, How old is he now? 22, 21. Okay. Yeah, so it's a long-term project. They sign him for three or four years. And of course, in French League, he will have more opportunities. But speaking with Mike James, Demo, John Brown as well, I saw how much they love the guy, uh, how much they support the guy. They try to, uh, you know, be good mentors uh, for him. And they really mm. believe in him. And I thought that, you know, Makundu kind of plays a lot of what uh, Chima Moneke can offer. But of course, I agree with you. If I believe that there's this year... All those top teams, they have a good shot at winning the EuroLeague. Mm. And if you can make your team deeper with Monek and another signing, that's huge for your long-term chances this year. I think you're but underestimating Monek a little bit, uh, at least from what I saw in Spain. He can play with the ball. He has some nice handles uh, for, for someone who plays as a power forward. So he can create. He's not necessarily a very good shooter, although he attempts to shoot the ball. At least that's what he did in, in Spain last year. Uh, I don't need so many playmakers. 16% from three this year. 16%. The, how many games did he play? 20. 20 games. Okay. Yeah, I'm not expecting him to be a, a good and consistent shooter. Maybe they expected Adrian Mormon to be that stretch four guy. But for sure. It seems saw like how, he's out. How that didn't work ended. out. So uh, last season, Monaco, in my eyes, they were too deep. They signed too many players. Now, this season, they're not deep enough. In some particular positions, yeah. You can see how one injury can hurt them badly. And when you have two players out, for example, Lloyd is out, Donta Hall is out, then that's a real problem. They need a stretch for, in my eyes, 100%. Even if they sign Moneke. You know, if they have John Brown, Moneke, and the stretch four, you put John Brown sometimes at the five in the... I would really enjoy watching him in the closing lineups at the five for uh, for Monaco. And uh, but they badly need, you know, we all know all great teams need a need a stretch four. And especially if if you are planning to finish your games with a with a trio of uh, Lloyd, Okobo, and James, you need a stretch four in there for sure. Not not two guys that cannot, you know, shoot from outside. And uh, this is why my pick for the best uh, signing around the tra transfer deadline is no, none other than Chris Singleton. Exactly, I have. The and uh, the I mean, we, we don't you don't have same. you don't have many choices to make. We already talked about mm -hmm. how Jalgiri has made a great move, um, but I don't know. Anadolu F has just made a, a, a great, let's say, re-signing of the player, <laughs> especially <laughs> fit-wise. He knows everything there. He probably missed uh, half of the season. He came back into the practice and there was nothing changed. There was every... every Except he found Will Clyburn. Yeah, exactly. So the <laughs> team, you know, you you are coming back to the team that just won twice the EuroLeague and you missed half of the season. Maybe you, you know, want, you have the desire to play basketball uh, immediately. You're, you know, missing basketball and stuff. And uh, I don't know. I already saw how confident he is and how his basically job will be to make shots when needed. And against Barcelona, you know, 
he already shown yeah. some flashes yeah. of that and and also in be physical in the playoffs yeah to be physical he, against he, bigs like Nikola Mirotic he did a nice job in, in Barcelona game he did an amazing job against Vezenkov stopping him in the semifinal last year and it, take, it speaks a lot about his experience and physicality that this team was actually lacking of uh, I mean he's so different than Polonara is and actually that's the flip they needed and I think that it makes this small adjustment makes uh, this FS team uh, way better in terms of what lineups they can offer and how they can cover some uh, weaknesses they have. I'm, I'm, I'm no, I'm junk, jumping, you know, from to the other topic. But to me, it's just insane the second lineups that FS have. You see the game, you see the lineup they have at the start of the second quarter, at the start of the at the end of the first quarter. You have Barcelona's subs coming in, and you have uh, FS lineup of, of uh, you know either it's Larkin on Mitic at the one. Bobois at the two, Will Clyburn at the three because he's coming from the bench. Then you have Mbaye and then you have Zizic or, or Brian Dunstan. And that's, you know, one, and that's, you know. Or Tibor Plies. Tibor Plies. Or Tibor Plies, you know, he was, he started in Bar Barca game. So that was yeah, yeah. Zizic after. And, and in the end of the first, there was a possession where uh, Bobois is playing a pick and roll on the, on the right side. And he's an amazing pick and roll player. You know, he's such a good scorer, can drive in. He's, I, I checked the stats, he's shooting, uh, he's making 1.3 points per one pick and roll, according to Instat. So you have to be aggressive against him. You can't let him shoot mid ranges because that's automatic two points or three points. So they, uh, you know, aggressively go onto him. He makes a pass, short roll, four on three situation. And on the weak side, you have uh, Will Clyburn and Vasily Mitic. I mean, that's just, ridiculous in my eyes you know to have such luxury on the court at basically at all times because you have so much talent on that roster that you can manipulate Ergen Ataman can ma manipulate the lineups to have a starting lineup basically of any other team and and any minute of the game that's that's just ridiculous yeah, that's you what know what else, well, what else is, is ridiculous that they're not uh, playing the same way against Valencia to lose <laughs> against Valencia without Chris Jones and Jared Harper with without, these lineups and without with these lineups yeah Harper was out Chris Jones was out somebody else was out probably four players I think Rivera were out and Rivera Clever. Clever. I mean they were missing like at least four players and important players Chris Jones is, is, is yeah, a key player I, I would yeah. say for them and so. that just that just tells you F is plays when they want yeah, to play. That's true. Yeah. Like Barcelona game meant something to them. Yeah. The yeah. only problem I have is that you are eighth at the moment. So you kind of need to play every game. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You Although should, they you should wins be more serious. From the second seed. I, you can't risk uh, arriving at the last rounds and having to beat someone yeah. in the last rounds. At know? least this year, you should take the regular season a little bit more seriously because uh, the competition is a mess. And every week the standings change and I know there's still many games left to be played uh, we've only started uh, the second uh, part, part, of the part of the season yeah but FS need to take these games more seriously like it it's painful to see a team with so much talent and quality losing in Valencia no disrespect to Alex Mumbro and the Valencia team it shouldn't happen yeah, actually, a lot of respect for, for them winning that game. It's yeah, crazy. Yeah, yeah, the they, they, did their part. All they did their part. It's cool. With, with all the injuries they yeah, had. Yeah, it's cool. They did it. Like, but come on, man. Like, I remember when Efes arrived in Konas. Well, for some reason, maybe Jalgiris Arena it, it's, is a trigger to them. You see a sold out. They want to play, they win. Sometimes I don't understand what's the trigger for Efes. Really, Barcelona for sure is Barcelona, yeah. and especially bouncing back from that Valencia game. That was a, I think that was a, a huge problem for Barca that they lost that game against uh, Valencia. Mm. And speaking of Singleton, I think that the timing for this signing is perfect because we already we already questioned Singleton's body language and effort level in the previous two seasons because usually he stepped up his game from the quarterfinals in the, in the final four. Now Singleton is like skipping the first rough part of the season. He will have mm. like a couple of months to get in his um, highest level um, shape and then he will perform. And I mean, he took time off uh, to relax, to focus on uh, beyond basketball stuff. He does a lot of stuff uh, business-wise and also um, social things-wise, uh, uh, I would say helping some communities, which is not 
um, told enough, uh, I would say. So he had time off, uh, and now in some time he will back in, uh, he will get back in his shape. And as I said, he's a perfect fit for this FS team. Mm -hmm. so, Dantas, how did you like to see Ergen Ataman um, call out the free pit for the first time <laughs> in live television in Barcelona? Was it the first time? I mean, he showed three fingers, I think, for the first time. Well, sure. first of all, I'm so in his world, the free pit is already done. Happened. It happened. It happened. It yeah. already what happened. happened. They're going for a four pit. Why he's showing then, you know? He, well, he's just reminding people that he, oh, he, he already won three in, the in the a row. Okay, my bad, my bad. Now he's going for the fourth one. No, I wasn't surprised at all. He's hilarious. He actually uh, did a great interview before the game to sincerely apologize to anybody who got offended the last time in Palau Blograna he was showing fists. Uh, you know, and and, and mm. proving that you know he won the cup, uh, so it was a nice interview. But all, despite that, he was still booed by Barca fans heavily. And actually, just in the end of his march from the tunnel to to the bench, he showed like two fingers that I, I came back as a two-time uh, Euroleague champ, and he showed those three Rem fingers to me. FS fans uh, after yeah, the game know, because they were on the top. Yeah. So it was not something against Blograna fans and and yeah it's no but I, I'm saying it was you know cool that he was <laughs> saying you know showing to the fans in the middle of the season round 19 uh, like, Ataman said cool Ataman said he, he he likes being compared to to Mourinho yep so if you like being compared to Mourinho the third season he, is not a good one <laughs> you can but you can take some other um lessons like for Mourinho every game is a must Mm. He wants uh. to win every game, whatever it takes. Whether you play beautiful football or ugly football, he wants to win every single game. Ataman doesn't really care about some of these games. And your team doesn't care about some of these games. So you might compare him to Mourinho... Uh, Titles-wise. About his titles, about what happens in the press room. You cannot really compare them as coaches in their respective sports. And, you know... <laughs> You know, FS are not playing defensive style of uh, basketball. Uh, they can sometimes play good defense. It's That's been true. shown this season. That's true. They can be good. Uh, I the, mean, the game was awesome. Also. We're pretty sure they're going to be in the playoffs. No one's uh, doubting that. But sometimes I find it kind of like irritating when you watch these good players and you just see that today they don't want to give 100%. And it sort of makes me angry i'm sitting there by the television valencia fs valencia do something good yeah that's that's nice <laughs> why don't you perform i'm thinking to myself just do your thing win this game you're the better team what the fuck fs is uh you know what is a new year league team that plays like an nba team right you could in, say in that this yeah. season. in the regular like season they yeah. just have nights off and and, yeah, and that's many it. nights off uh, as long as they're in the playoffs, they're okay, I think. Maybe they want to win the EuroLeague from the eight seed. What do you know? What do we know? I think they they need they need new challenges. They already won twice, so I think there's a thin line between confidence and arrogance. I think mm -hmm. you should treat the competition with a bit more respect because the home court advantage matters. Do you want to play a game five? In Madrid, in Barcelona, Piraeus, for example. in Piraeus, instead of playing it in Istanbul, do you want it? I don't think so. As confident as you are. True. So, FS, this team, should not only make the playoffs. They should definitely be one of the top four seeds. And arguably, they should be the number one seed. Two wins only from the fourth. Yes, they might finish wins. it at number one. I'm, I'm not saying they won't, but it's, uh, it's just that my take from what yeah, I've yeah. seen so far. Uh, Ergin's son, Sarp, was also in the arena. He was actually uh, helping Shane Larkin to do his shooting drills. He was contesting, Sarp was contesting Larkin's shots. And actually, that's, that's awesome. Uh, the best indicator how time fly, uh, flies is just watching Sarp, you know, growing so fast because I got used to, you know, to, to get in FS games like every four months and he's ch changing so quickly. <laughs> so he's a legend. I, I don't remember anybody, like, any dad and son relationship in the EuroLeague or at any level probably to be as close as, as Ataman has. With well, I son. think Svetislav Pesic and Marko Pesic had their own stories <laughs> in Bayern. Probably, probably. Did uh, this, this, did the, uh, 
Pesci's junior fire his dad from coaching position? Or am I wrong? <laughs> How did that end? I don't remember, to be honest. Yeah, okay, never yeah. mind. But they had this connection, you know, as adults, let's say. For sure. To see the assistant coach kid sure. uh, development, player development coach probably, it's, it's pretty rare. Yeah, and mm, we have Singleton as our top picks. For the second position, I have Aquila Polonara, uh, basically. Although I'm not so sure if he's the best player for Jalgiris and this Kazis Maxvitis game, because I see him um, being as the best fit in a higher tempo team, uh, like or for, like he was in shining in Basconia. But at the same time, as you mentioned, it was so hard to find a great stretch for, and it is so hard to find a good stretch for to this day, that it's an amazing job that Jalgiris did, bringing him to Konos, although it felt like Red Star, okay, since they had a ban, it was a different conversation, but Red Star, Maccabi, and I think that somebody else was also, Virtus, were also uh, after Polonara, and to see him landing in Konos, it's something amazing. To, to replace Kavanaugh with Polonara, it's it's mind-blowing. It's an improvement, Jorgis. actually. True. It's true. not only an addition, it's an yeah. improvement. You're getting proven Euroleague player. For sure, he, he needs some time, right? Like in these first two games, he only played 14, 15 minutes. Basically, he's... Uh, duty was to get Schmitz some rest, but looking f going forward, I could see Ralgiris uh, having uh, more interesting lineups, uh, moving Schmitz to the fifth yeah. uh, position more often, playing him with Polonara in the same lineup. I, I, it is possible. Polonara also played as a center in his previous years at some yeah, situations. Yeah. So, so uh, what you said about being the best fit. I, I, I don't think it is possible to find a perfect player, especially in January. You're just going for the best available player, and there were no better options than Polonara. Uh, we had rumors that Jalgiris is basically trying to sign either Polonara or Mormon. I think they, they went for the better player. That's for sure, because Mormon, I, I don't know if he, he still has it in him to be as good as he once was. And Polonara, yes, he struggled a bit in Fenerbahce. Um, in FS, he didn't find his place, let's say. But let's remember how he played for Italy in September. It was not so long ago. Yeah. And Mormon is 34. And Polonara, I think, is 30 31. or 31. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and for your third pick, what do you have in top three? No, I have Jalgiri Singleton and ah. I had the uh, biggest impacts in the season is by far Luca Vildoza still, but that's, uh, but that's uh, another time. Yeah. That happened not in November. I had a question, guys. What do you think about Nikola Miritich on the bench for the fourth quarter in the Barca comeback? I know the reasoning why, like, you know, because Barca made a run and Charles just kept the same players. But it was, uh, first of all, you know, Miritich, why I'm asking? Because in the first quarter, every FS possession went uh, exactly. through Miritich, basically. It was they not were, his night. They were uh, attacking him in first five positions in a row. They were having huge success because they got this huge lead in the first quarter. And uh, Barca couldn't really make anything until the, until the fourth quarter. Mm. And I was rooting for the comeback, but... Uh, only because my family was to watch that game in Barcelona, so <laughs> <laughs> I wanted them to see an, a really nice comeback. But um, it was Oscar da Silva actually making huge plays, and mm. Nikola Mirotic on the bench for them. He played, I think, only 19 minutes. I think it's the reality of the Euroleague. Simply, uh, when you, you go with the you, you go with the flow. You go with what works at that time. Uh, that's why you, when you compare Euroleague with the NBA, that's one of the differences in the NBA the best player or the highest paid player will never be uh, left out from the fourth quarter. Oh, bench, imagine. And for Mirotic, maybe it's a bitter pill to swallow, but you need to realize he's that... He's just it, coming back from the injury as well. He's not the same Mirotic that Exactly. We were, it's a double game week yeah. also. They needed him to play extended minutes in Villarban in Astrobal Arena because they had a really tough game with Aswell for some reason. Uh, they they needed Corey Higgins to do his clutchness to actually win the game in the fourth quarter, although Asphalt was without the colo. Corey Higgins is also another guy who is like Teodosic right now, playing amazing basketball yep. in, in this stretch. Yep, I agree. So I don't really have a problem with Mirotic sitting. 
And at, at that time, it was probably better for the team. And what Charles exactly. does is always yeah, you go with the flow. In the best interest of the team, like it's not like he's benching Mirotic to show something to him. <laughs> mm, I think it it just happened at that time. It was it was the best yeah. option. They went with it. They were close to making a comeback. In the end, they didn't. FS was the better team on the night, and that's it. I have another question for you guys. Where would we rank Campbell Walker, Walker if he signed with Bottom. Milan? <laughs> Why would you Where? sign a player? Bottom. Bottom. <laughs> Bottom of the list. Why would you sign a player with no knees? That is insane. We talked with Reedis before the pod. That is insane. For a Downstairs, team which already like, has a huge injury history. Yeah, I'm sorry. Their main uh, players, and Campbell that's Walker, why they're suffering right now. He's, uh, he was... With with the knees he has, I don't think he's elevating Milano's offense as much, and he's hurting the be- one of the best defensive teams defensively a lot. If he arrives in the Euroleague, in Milan, for example, I think he would have already arrived. Uh, for let's say he plays one good game, yeah. scores twelve points, then he's gonna be out for five games. That's what happened with him in the last three or four years. The man has no knees. He he's not capable of playing. Uh, basketball for a longer distance that's why mark cuban released him he had a 32 point game night and after that he disappeared because he just cannot carry the load physically and i think if he arrives it's it's a big question mark whether he passes the medicals so it, it's 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 an insane idea that Kemba Walker could do something in the Euroleague right now and could make Milan a winning team or anything like that. You could find much better options, even if you look at these NBA uh, players or even some of these big names. Even Carmelo Anthony standing uh, by the three-point line as a spot-up shooter would be a better idea than uh, Kemba Walker without knees. I think this season... This this uh, this week for Mil- Milano was just the last uh, pill to to let's say understand that this season they're not they are not making a comeback this season. I mean, I don't I don't see I don't see how they could change this season, and I don't think you know they need to sign Campbell Walker. I don't I don't think he would be that guy who suddenly brings Milano to the eighth spot. And Milano starts winning, even though they badly need someone who can create their own shots because their system is based on that, you know, on individual mm. creators. And I'm saying this pre- probably for the third time, but the best periods they have last year were with uh, Chacho Rodriguez going on these crazy runs, five minute, five minute runs coming off the bench, doing basically everything, scoring, passing, creating advantages, and then others just living off of that, you know. And right now they don't they don't have a guy who could do that. Siobhan Shields is out, and uh, Kevin Pangos. I think uh, he was expected to come back at yeah, the end of January, and now uh, he's about expected March, I uh, early March. Uh, and late, even when healthy, he didn't play as mm, we exactly. expected. Yeah. So I, I agree with you completely. I just have to say that it seemed like Milan already went through the Great Depression. But now uh, they're going through the Great Depression 2.0, which is a really sad thing. But that's how it is. It's painful to watch their offense. I know against Jalgiris they made uh, some sort of a comeback with Baron and Hall hitting shots, and Jalgiris has just stopped playing at, at at one point. But it's hard to see a basketball team where nobody creates for each other and for himself, and you always uh, finish your possession uh, with the shot clock running down. Uh, taking difficult shots and some players just lost their confidence. They cannot make an open shot. To be honest, like you're saying, they missing. They are shooting last second shots, but also they are missing so many open open looks. looks. They're missing, yeah, for sure. And Luva Vukabaro addition. They don't get really many open looks. They get some. But yeah, they're they miss missing. Them. They're missing. Except and from Billy Barron, other guys, yeah, they're missing yeah. them. Yeah, and Luva Vukabaro signing didn't change much. Messina is trying to make some sort of a point forward from him. It's not really working out in my eyes. So yeah, this this team. Some players are really disappointing, like Feutman, for example. I thought he's a good stretch for a good signing for Messina system where everything is based on good spacing and players creating from ISO situations or pick and rolls and Feutman. Whenever he gets an open look, he doesn't make it. So what's the point of having him on the court? He doesn't play anymore. It's either Deshaun Thomas, Nicolo Melli, or Heinz and Davis in the same lineup. 
and Messina after losing to Jalgiris is still trying to be positive and he says like I'm going home happy knowing that Stefano Tonut had a good game <laughs> okay yeah, sure thing let's Let's just look for the positives. <laughs> what, what else to be? What else can you do in this situation? Exactly. And <laughs> signing Kemba Walker could be something only for entertainment purposes to bring a big, uh, big name. Sell, sell the tickets. Uh, maybe George Armani uh, is thinking like the season is hopeless anyway, so we might as well sign a big NBA player. <laughs> mm. uh, yeah, and Kemba Walker is on the market, but yeah, it's. As sad as it is to watch Milan, it's also kind of sad to talk about them. Depressing. The last the Great Depression. <laughs> the last Euroleague uh, topic to discuss pretty quickly, the most famous kiss of the year probably. Sasha Bradovic oh. kissing the logo of Red Star before Monaco and Red Star game. What would be your initial reactions? I don't have any problems with that. If if that's how he feels about the club, that's that's the club where he started his playing career and everything. Uh, I'm I'm fine with that. I don't I don't really care. What I care about is that his team didn't show up. Maybe they didn't have enough energy after a tough Olympiacos game, but <laughs> that's the only issue for me. Yeah, um, you have different feelings about that. No, I think that is something. Like I'm trying to, for example, imagine it was Shar Sharas coming back and kissing Jalgiris logo in the middle of the arena. How it would that would look to me? I think Against. it was something very unnecessary, to be honest. It was his second visit. Did he shot us as a player for uh, Olympia Ljubljana coming back to Kona he Sports Hall? He did like uh, point the finger uh, to the court saying like, you should have signed mm -hmm. me. Sign me. I should have been here. You didn't believe in me. Now I'm I'm playing for <laughs> Slovenian team going to the final four. Uh, I, I know he was a player, not a coach at the time. And he was pretty young. To me, like it's something. Maybe it's it's just the way Serbians show respect, because maybe maybe I don't understand it because we don't understand it because it's like the we don't have Serbian as the partisan thing going on from the first days of your life, basically, as I saw in that documentary. Uh, so it's probably something you know we can't really judge because we are not in, into that culture. But from my perspective, you it's it's enough, you know, basically to show your love in the press conferences on or or I don't know whatever whatever you want. But that was I don't know. There's some story behind uh, which might explain some things. Uh, I think that before the game on Serbian media, Obradovic, I, I I I'm not sure if it was the actual quote of the Red Star president Chovic or it was just an article, but. He was Obradovic was presented as a biggest enemy of Restar. Let's let's remember that he Restar was his first team. He he said in Kiss explanation video uh, that uh, you know he was always a Zvezda fan. Uh, it was his first team. He has a lot of emotions about this team, and you know he truly he, he was you know uh, Zvezda guy until until death. Uh, and uh, he was presented as the biggest enemy enemy of the red star before this game because if i am correct when he worked for red star and he was fired during the season it happened like three years ago or something or two seasons ago uh i think that he demanded to get a bonus of his contract and that termination uh, situation for the cup that he wasn't actually the head coach of the team but the rest won the serbian cup i think that year and at least mm. from what I heard that, you know, Obradovic during this termination process, he wanted to get the bonus for that. Uh, I don't know what okay. was uh, written in the contract, but anyway, so, you know, Zvezda took it as, let's say, offensive and, and not fair uh, because, you know, money-wise, they had to calculate uh, money and, and things. But so, he said in a television I, interview that there were some misunderstandings in the past and I hope it's now all okay. That's like the ultimate sign of respect and love for the, for the club. I don't know. How did Serbian people react? That, that's what I want to know. They applauded the, the, the fans cheer, cheered him. Yeah, yeah. And on a social uh, like social media, what's what's there? I didn't. I know that you probably don't know, story, but it would yeah. it would be interesting to know. So, I don't if see anyone what, what, could write a comment, you know. Yeah. Or yeah. what what do you guys think and, about? And correct this? me if I was wrong, but I've heard that yeah. there was some important context behind that move. I just don't. Although see I still what the think it was is, man. To me, what the only thing that matters is the game. Zvezda played 
Probably, Maybe that's the problem. They lost probably, the game badly. Well, but Zuleska played the, the game Lago. of the season, I would say. Not necessarily defensively, but offensively, that was for sure the, the game of the season. Vildosa is back. Uh, He's back the, faster than expected, right? Yes. He, mm -hmm. he played like limited minutes, but he did play. And, and yeah. when he was on the court, he was uh, spectacular. Uh, Petrushev is dominating and everybody was oh. making shots that night. Everybody was making shots. They're taking shots in transition. They're scoring off turnovers. Uh, the crowd is, is, is on fire. E even Mike James scoring with good numbers didn't really affect the game that much uh, because he didn't have enough help. So Monaco didn't show up for the game. Zvezda was amazing. And Obradovic kissing the logo, uh, to me, doesn't it, it doesn't really concern me at all, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> Uh, Filip Petrushev. Yeah. What a run he is having. The most dominant uh, big man on offense right now in the league. You know, to me, his case is something uh, I re want to really shout out Roland Schmitz and these two guys. Yeah. Uh, these two guys c came uh, to lower teams from uh, from a big team from Barcelona and, and FS and right now they are showing their worth and that's, that's awesome to see and... Uh, they're both playing amazing right now, even though uh, Dusko didn't really like uh, Petrushev's performance mm. in, in the last uh, games. But uh, He puts him in the fourth position quite often. When, yeah. When they ha don't have Ben Bentil, uh, you see him in the lineup with Mitrovic, for example, starting the game. So you have Mote Yunus with Mitrovic, and John Brown is, is, is trying to contain uh, Petrushev. So... He can play as a four, as a five. Right now, he's just dominating on offense. He's putting the numbers every single night. The guy who's also putting numbers is Domanda Sabonis. He's averaging 19 points per game, 12.5 rebounds, 7.1 assists. And there's this big conversation among Kings fans, Kings people, Kings community, Lithuanian fans. If Domanda Sabonis should be selected for the third NBA All-Star appearance, it should be a lock. He should but be not in the starting lineup, I think, because there there are too many big names. But he should be in the All Star game. He must be in the All Star game. The that's crazy that he's not even in the top ten of the exactly. voting. Well, but that's exactly. the thing with the popular vote. Do you expect yeah, the American audience to 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 vote for for some Lithuanian dude? And it's not like the Kings. It's not fans. like he's the MVP he's, or anything. A huge fan base. And 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 it's not like Kings is the most popular organization. Mm. They're always overshadowed in California by. The LA Lakers uh, and you can see in, you can see in the voting uh, that the big teams are getting that, that the players of the big teams are getting a random votes like I think Kevon Looney is in the top 10 of mm. the yeah yeah front court voting exactly like. because of the Warriors how popular they are uh, even though the team is underperforming badly so the Kings are overperforming Dalmonte Sabonis is playing his best basketball at the moment I think his numbers are even better than they were in in in, uh, in the Pacers He's, um, there are only three players averaging 15 points, 10 rebounds at least, and five assists per, games, uh, per game, and it's only Yanis, Jokic, and Sabonis. And like the, some more advanced stats on, on Sabonis. Num he's number th third in all NBA in offensive win shares. So he's impacting offense in a crazy way there in Sacramento. And I enjoy watching him playing at the five finally and only that position and not yeah. sharing yeah, the court yeah. with another big that's, Amazing, finally happy for him because he, that, that's where he's the best and they're using him awesome. And I remember uh, you had an interview with a quick interview in the Eurobasket, I think with Mike, Mike Brown. Brown. Yeah. And you even sent me a text message like, what, what could I ask Mike Brown? And like, I said like, how could you use Sabonis? And he was saying, I would use him in the high post situations more. Where, like Jokic. Yeah. And, and exactly, he's, he's doing exactly that from the first game of the season. So it's really cool to see that. And his, uh, his offensive rating is um, third uh, from all centers. And uh, he's number one in rebounds and in win shares. That's basically collects all the defensive stats and offensive stats. And the impact he's having, he's fourth in the NBA in win shares behind Nikola Jokic, Luka Doncic, and Kevin Durant. Mm. <laughs> Solid that's group. it. He's the, he's the fourth guy yeah. in, in this list. And that's... I mean, if that's not and the case for he, his... He also leads the league in screen assists, and Kings are fourth in the West. So that's that's pretty He's awesome. He's very good at playing handoffs, actually, yeah. Sometimes even faking the handoff and going for, for a layup. Uh, to me, what, what is amazing that after the first two weeks of the regular season, people were talking how they're not using Domoto Sabonis properly, 
and he was their uh, third or fourth uh, player by uh, the number of shots he takes. Oh. And he's not taking a lot of a lot of shots. You know? Yeah, but exactly after the first two weeks of the regular season, it didn't even look like he's he has the impact. Mm. on the team it was all about the Aaron Fox it was all about Kevin Herter as a shooter and all, and all the other guys and you basically had Sabonis as your third or fourth player mm. but that was just for two weeks and after that everything changed it uh, I think uh, Fox had an injury they had to play some games without him and all of a sudden it's clicking and you see Sabonis with with a triple double which was like 25 15 and 16 yeah recently the only second guy after larry bird who also had two steals yeah. and two blocks uh, he has to be in the all-star lineup for sure uh popular vote is not in his favor we can see that but the good thing is that not everything is decided by a popular vote so he should be picked that's true and he should be there for the third time and for the first time in the west because uh, he was a uh, two-time all-star in the east and actually uh, he still needed some players to be injured and out of the All-Star game to make it. Right now, I think even if everyone's healthy, all these big, big-name players, he still should be on the list. Definitely. W where would you rank him among the top West centers? Um, mm, there is Jokic, the Davis, Towns, Sabonis, Aiton. Well, the way the Timberwolves are playing and the way that Towns... Gobert project is yeah. going. I cannot really put Carl Anthony Towns higher than Sabonis right now. Uh, basically, he's probably only behind Jokic. Mm. I'm not sure. I mean, DeAndre Ayton is a good center, but he doesn't do what Sabonis does. Yeah. So probably That's pretty solid recognition. Probably then. you put him uh, at number two. If you take the whole at league, this moment, yeah. if you take the whole league, you have Jokic and Bead, and I would go for a Debio ahead of Sabonis, but then you have him as the fourth or fifth best center mm. in the league this season. I'm not saying that in general no, he's yeah. completely the better player comparing to let's say Carl Anthony Towns, but this season, yeah, for sure. That's pretty solid recognition, right? I'm just happy I had a chance to play with Domus. <laughs> and you said you were oh, a yeah. roommate of, of Domus exactly. or no? What? You were a roommate with him at the youth national team? For a short time. Okay. For a short time. But I had the chance to play with him for one summer. And like you said, with the handoffs with him is just ama amazing to the, the best uh, pick and roll companion that you can ask for. Like he will give you advantage and you don't even need to dribble before arriving to that advantage. So simply amazing the way he catches the ball, he finishes around the rim, everything else, just next level. You could, he was 17 at the time, we were all 18 year olds and you mm -hmm. could already see that he was uh, way above everyone else. I remember when he played his first games for Malaga, I didn't really think he's gonna be this big shot player like, mm -hmm. like he is right now. Is people were still talking that he's the son of Arvido Sabonis, so that basically helps him. You can't to, really, to, uh, you can't really go away from the name yeah. until you reach the the mm. high levels. That's I, exactly pretty and impossible to do. Probably was the best decision for him to go to Gonzaga at that time. He was already sure that he was going yeah. to to the NCAA, and it it worked out perfectly for him i mean when he was drafted we also although okay see if it was terrible i mean to make him a stretch for you're playing next to russell westbrook and you the, why the, are you just drafting him the then? whole thunder project they didn't draft him orlando mm -hmm. magic drafted him yeah but they traded yeah. ah that was this big there, trade. there was yeah. a trade yeah, maybe yeah. they they were not thinking about sabonis as a part of yeah, this I big mean, picture i you mean are, thunder, you, are, you are not changing your team uh, around the rookie yeah. when you have russell westbrook thunder at that like, time they had a him in clear idea and, and a clear project uh, Russell Westbrook has to be the MVP, averaging a triple double. That was the only the, the only idea behind the team, honestly, because there's no more Harden, no more KD. It's just Russ. Now this is his MVP season, and you're just gonna be part of it. So play your part, grab a rebound, make a shot when you can. That's it. And of course, after Domantas Sabonis moved to, to 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 the Indiana Pacers, we saw what he's actually capable of doing on the NBA court. And in the Kings right now, he's just whew, balling. Peak, Amazing. Uh, peak Sabonis. He's making Kings a, a potential playoff team. Before the season, Finally. I could, before the season, I could only see them as a 
playing tournament team and actually uh, the bottom seed, mm. like the ninth or the mm. tenth. Right now, I could easily see them finishing in the fifth or sixth position. Of course, it's going to be tough because because uh, the West is crazy. But so far, they're they're playing some quality basketball. And Kings uh, have this b- the best uh, thing right now going in the NBA, which is light the beam. <laughs> After every win, they're lighting this beam on the city and it's just crazy. I don't know if you're following Domas on the socials, he is posting these mm-hmm. ridiculously funny stories of him uh, in the office uh, and, you know, faces of each player on, on these on this, on this people. It's really, really funny to me that they're going along with this with this stuff. And he, he in some games, he got that defensive player of the game chained, <laughs> 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 right? Yeah, the, uh. the Kings are finally fun to watch after 16 years of hurt, I would say. <laughs> the last time they were relevant was when Stojakovic Mike was, Bibi was playing, was playing with the... Mike Bibby and the Christie. You know, this sounds Chris like a Weber. story where we are talking about <laughs> the football and Donatas is uh, mentioning random football players from two, two, 2000. So that's how uh, old the Kings. Uh, that's true. And if, if Domas makes the All-Star game, he will be only the... Uh, third guy of coming off Kings after Chris Webber and the Marcus Cousins, I think, to make the All Star game. That's that's also tells a lot about that gap this organization had. For sure. The fun story to remember is that I did. I remember I did a lot of coverage about Sabonis at youth level when he was okay. He was in in transition between Malaga and Gonzaga, and he was dominating at youth level already. And I remember all these comments after uh, under this article that, oh, you got paid by Arvid Sabonis for sure <laughs> for kissing uh, Thomas ass. I'm like, he's going to be the third oh. time All-Star player, probably, or very likely. That would be historical achievement for Lithuanian basketball because before I think we had Ilgauskas twice. Mm. And these are the only Lithuanians to make that game. But the problem that some of these people still have with Donato Sabon is that he didn't really perform for the on FIBA yeah. yet. Yeah, Didn't really have any big tournament yet where you could say he's the star of the show. Mm. And that again brings up the topic about Donato Sabon is playing alongside Jonas Valanciunas mm. and how different it is from what he does does on the NBA court. Yeah, that will be another f- storyline to follow. I think that's enough, guys. We're already uh, discussing basketball things for an hour and 33 minutes. That's huge, but that also shows how we, mi- how we missed each other, probably, after this week off, right? How we missed you, Donat. A lot, yeah. A lot. You were with Mike and, and Demo, so you shouldn't complain about missing people. No, I'm not complaining <laughs> at all. I'm just faking <laughs> and it. And so. talking basketball. <laughs> you had plenty of basketball talks on your trip, too I many, think. Too many, too <laughs> many, too many. Okay, guys, thanks a lot. Just a quick reminder, press this like button, uh, subscribe to our channel, and join BN Plus community to help us grow. Did you say press dislike button? No, I don't. Okay. Or it's actually pr- possible. If I said that Shabazz Don't Napier, press dislike button. No. Please yeah. press like button. Yeah.